Welcome to the Travel Like a Boss podcast, where we interview location-independent entrepreneurs that travel the world like a boss by being their own boss. Here's your host, Johnny FD. Willkommen zur neuen Episode vom Reisen wie ein Boss Podcast. Heute mit Johnny FD und wir reden über ein typisch deutsches Thema, Krankenversicherung. <lacht> Hallo, super, Dankeschön. Ähm Now I confuse Johnny, <laughs> but uh, let's not confuse the, uh, the audience. We switch back to English. No, we're going to do this whole episode in German. Welcome to the Travel Like a Boss podcast. This is episode 216. And I am here with Christoph Holmberg. Ho Ho I don't know how to say your name. <laughs> so then let's keep it a secret. No, nine. Okay. So uh, Christoph uh, is from Germany. If you guys haven't heard yet. And one of the things that a lot of European digital nomads and location independent entrepreneurs, you know, business owners always ask is what type of tax breaks can we have as Europeans? Um, what do we do if we're traveling outside of our country and we lose our health insurance? Uh, like what's what is the difference between you know for americans is it is it better or worse and for me i actually always thought it was better for europeans because you guys can be out of the country for just i think half of the year while we have to be out for 11 months so i kind of wanted to dive in deep to all these things uh talk about some other things like health insurance as well but uh first off uh welcome to the show Yeah, thank you very much. And I hope I can uh, answer most of your questions, at least from my very own experience and the uh, experience I have uh, from talking to other digital nomads all over the world, uh, coming from different countries. And yeah, actually, uh, you guys with the American passport uh, are together with the Eritreans, uh, those two in the world um, with the, the biggest issues when it comes to taxation, um, traveling the world. It's much easier for Europeans, yeah. Okay, awesome. That's good to hear. Well, for you guys, not, not really for us. <laughs> But uh, if you guys want to know more about the kind of U.S. taxes, you can go back and listen to the episode with Grace Taylor on uh, U.S. tax laws. Also on YouTube, if you look for Nomad Summit, Grace Taylor, she did talk about that. But today we're really going to talk about Europeans. If you're American, don't worry. You're still going to enjoy this episode because if nothing else, you're going to see how crappy we have it. <laughs> Yeah, but also uh, if you thought about uh, as a U.S. citizen now, okay, I switch off or switch to the next episode. Actually, there is something in this episode that might be super interesting for you, especially if you do business with Europe, because we have uh, different topics today. And sure, uh, European uh, taxing and th uh, tax schemes is one. Um, health insurance is something I want to talk about as well. But uh, actually, the, the uh, occasion how Johnny and me met was about my other passion, um, which is talking about Estonian e-residency. Is this something, kind of before we dive into all of it, is this something that would benefit Australians or Canadians or people from other countries? Yes, of course. Okay. All right. So keep listening. Uh, let's get started. Do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously. Um, so can we get a little background on you? Like, where are you from? Where are you living now? What do you do for work? Yeah, sure. So my name is Christoph Hübner. Um, now to unveil the, the right pronunciation. And uh, actually, my name is originally written with some special German characters, an umlaut U, uh, but you wouldn't find me um, to that uh, with that on, on Facebook. So is that the O with the two dots on top? Uh, no, it's the U. Uh, the U with two dots oh, that makes wow. it an U, uh, which also um, is present in, in many other European languages like Hungarian or Estonian. They have O, U, E as well. And the Hungarians even have uh, short and long versions. So uh, just dots or even uh, some kind of uh, slashes on, on top of that. So Yeah, like a slash through an O or something. Yeah, in my case, it's just a U with two dots, which makes it an U. But basically, Germans then often write it if they don't have the U on their keyboard, U, E. And that's oh, how you wow. find me on Facebook, Twitter, uh, okay. and everywhere. So that's a fun fact for anyone who's ever wondered about those weird characters that we don't have in normal English. Uh, fun kind of trivia is, you know the, do you know how to spell Hagen does the ice cream brand? <laughs> yeah, which is um, uh, acting like being Danish, but it's American and they just came up with a brand because they thought people would uh, like it more. Yeah, it's funny because if you ask any Danish person, They always think it's a German brand. Oh, is it? And everyone else thinks it's Danish or European or something. But yeah, it was just invented in New York. And <laughs> they're just yeah. like, uh, 
let's make it fancy. How, how are we going to charge $5 for a little tiny thing of ice cream? Oh, let's make it European. Yeah, and actually the, the Danish do good ice cream. You wouldn't expect that uh, from a country so far um, north of Italy, but uh, they are they are well known for Danish ice cream, yeah. Yeah, and, it's, and, and Haagen-Dazs is really good. It's I would say it's the best American ice cream for sure. I'm not into big brands in ice cream. I really like these uh, local manufactories with uh, really strange uh, flavors. Um, so if I if I, I I'm I'm not that uh, strawberry chocolate and vanilla ice cream guy. Um, I take uh, the one. Uh, I, I mean, I've once been in Iceland in Reykjavik in an uh, ice cream parlor, and they had uh, mother's milk ice cream. I think that was the strangest stuff I, I ever had together with That's black so licorice disgusting. ice cream. That is so disgusting. Who, who was the mother? I don't know. Oh my god! I, I'd want to at least see a photo of whose breast milk I'm eating. <laughs> oh, this is really bad. <laughs> okay, let's change topics again. I was actually I was just starting to talk about who I am and my background, and then we ended up this. <laughs> okay, so uh, my name is is Chris. Um, I am now 36 years old. Uh, originally coming from Germany, grew up in in southern Germany. Used to live in Berlin for the last 10 years before I left Germany. And um, yeah, since then I'm a perpetual traveler and um, digital nomad, if you will. So some people struggle with that term. And um, in most of the cases, I would just call me nomad and and, uh, traveling entrepreneur. Um, I earn my money in the insurance industry. So actually I run a little company in, in Germany that specialized in children's health insurance plans for the German market. So we are a little team of uh, six now. So it's my my managing co-managing director, my business partner, and me, and four employees. And we all work fully remotely. So the team is distributed over Europe. I'm the only one uh, currently outside of Europe, but the others are um, in Spain, in Portugal, um, or this weekend um, spending it uh, in the Alps for skiing. And once in a week uh, on on Wednesday morning, we have our team meeting on Google Hangout. Uh, but that's uh, basically uh, the the one regular meeting where we see each other. And then twice a year, we meet for uh, one week team event somewhere in Europe. And that's the next um, next physical appointment in my calendar is in May in Spain when I meet my team. Oh, that's cool. And do you guys always pick a random place to meet in, in Europe, or how do, like where have you guys been in the past? So um, four times a year, uh, or at least the last years, it was four times a year. This year it's going to be only two times. Uh, we go to baby trade shows in major German cities. That's just a weekend. And uh, then we connect that team uh, event, team meeting to that. So our last long team meeting was in November in Berlin. Um, and there we decided uh, for next time we're going to be in uh, in Spain, in Andalusia in, in May. And um, we will meet again in, in fall where is still open no idea um, but what we also going to, to do in addition is uh, we want to accomplish a half marathon with a full team and as this uh, did not come from um, from us as founders but from the middle of the the crew um, we fully support that and and we're gonna uh, pay for that and have a, a long weekend uh, as it looks like in September in in the Netherlands we do the Halve van Harlem half marathon in, in Harlem near Amsterdam and that's a, a third time we meet outside of the business uh, the baby intro, um, um. the baby shows yeah, yeah. The baby trade shows so I think that's, that's really cool that you guys have a remote distributed team I, I really believe that this is the future of working in, it's just in general and also to be honest smaller companies I think are so much more efficient than large corporations where no one really knows each other number one but also no one really knows what each other is doing or really cares about what what their job role is they're kind of just there for a paycheck versus a kind of a small to a medium team it feels like everyone takes a bit of personal personal responsibility you know everyone has a bigger role where they kind of feel like they're they're accomplishing something or what they're doing matters and then having you know the weekly skype calls but also more importantly the in-person meetups i think that's a really big benefit yeah, and actually these uh, weekly meetings are not like uh, strict business meetings with an agenda or something. Um, because we know we lack of those uh, 
talks at the coffee machine that you usually have when you when you work with your team in the in the same building um, we often started for the first 15 20 minutes or even half an hour just talking about random private stuff uh, where we currently hang out show them or tell them what we did the weekend and things like that before we start into uh, business conversations yeah and i think that's really helpful and, and healthy for for co-worker relationships for people to know each other on kind of a more personal level and actually next week's guest uh, lydia Machovics. I, I still I can't say her name either, but she was a, one of the speakers at Nomad Summit. She has a team, a remote distributed team, all in Slovakia, and they're going to be meeting in Greece somewhere, at, you know, for their meetup. So I think it's um, really cool that there's so many entrepreneurs who are traveling full time but are running companies with employees, you know, that are really making a, a difference and allowing their employees to work remotely as well. Um, yeah, I've I've talked about that with Lydia as well, but I'm not quite sure if uh, her team, if they're uh, employed uh, with regular employment contracts to her company or if they're like freelancers. Um, and most companies who have uh, remote teams, um, they they have freelancers. Um, as we are dealing with in an industry uh, that's quite regulated and restricted, uh, we only may um, have full employees uh, talking to the customers. So the insurance um, uh, consultancy and sales process uh, is very strictly strictly regulated, um, and yeah, that means we we must have the on a company paycheck with social insurance and, and all that stuff, which is kind of um, of rare uh, with remote companies. Um, but we really wanted to do that from the beginning as uh, this remote work is in the DNA of our company. So when I started with that with my business partner, uh, actually in 2010, um, we registered the company where he is uh, usually located, um, but that has been 600 kilometers away from where I used to live. And so uh, even with us two as, as founders working inside that company, there was never something like sitting together on a desk on a daily basis. And when we hired our first employee, which is just a bit more than one year ago, so the, the first uh, six and a half years, this company was more a bit like a, like a hobby and a passion where we thought there might be some, some business in it. And we still believed and reinvested every money, every, every euro that came in into some marketing experience. And most of them failed for many years. But in 2017, um, things started to work. And end of 2017, we hired our first one. Um, first January 2018, our second one. First of November um, 2018, our third one. And now first of January uh, this year, 2019, our fourth, uh, fourth employee. Um, and it was from the beginning clear this is, or actually before we hired our first one, we discussed, um, hmm, do we, do we now start to open up an office? Do we want to provide a desk and a chair and things like that? And we were quite sure, no, we don't. Um, let's see if it works to try and hire, um, digital nomads. And actually this did not go in the way we expected. We actually uh, published a, a job offer for, uh, we called it Digital Nomad for Children's Health Insurance. And we expected to find some some students with some insurance background because you need to have uh, some official certificates uh, of your job education. And it's like a, like a diploma. And uh, it's quite common in the industry that people uh, make this uh, graduation and then do something else, like study some some real thing. Um, and so we expected to find uh, some students who see this as a student job that they can take to a foreign sem semester without needing to, to cancel it. Um, but actually that didn't happen at all. Yeah, I can imagine that the location independence and you know the remote jobs are something that people don't really know they want until they've worked in corporate for a year or two and then they realize i don't want this and then maybe they'll go off on their own to you know try to start their own business and a lot of people realize it's hard to start a business it's a lot of work up front for no guarantee pay i mean pretty much every entrepreneur in the world that i've ever met like hundreds of people worked for you know two to six months if you know or a few years with zero pay or even it was costing them money to build the business in hopes that it eventually will pay off. And there's a lot of people in the world that it's just not in their personality to want to take that risk 
You know, they don't enjoy building the business. They don't want to take the risk. They would rather have the steady guaranteed paycheck of being an employee or a remote worker. And I, I don't judge them for it because I, I think in a lot of ways, it's it's equally, if not smarter sometimes to just be like, all right, I want the freedom of being able to work remotely, but I'm not, I don't want the responsibilities of starting a business from scratch. That's uh, one side of the medal, but the other side is that we um, attract a total different kind of people uh, than we we had thought in the beginning, um, which is much more senior people than we had expected. So um, the employees we hired are, let's say, uh, 10 to 20 years older than uh, what we uh, originally had in mind. So they have 10 to 20 years of um, uh, work and business experience. They have seen the world um, and they have uh, children themselves now. So our first employee is a, a single father uh, living uh, in, in southern Germany most of the time with his now, I think, uh, five-year-old son and he wanted a job that he can uh, do whenever he wants from wherever he wants and where he could also uh, somehow utilize his professional background in, in the industry um, and also our, our second employee is a mother uh, living in, in Portugal with her husband and her now six years old daughter and that's pretty much the same so these are really senior people uh, who have their master's degree uh, or are even working on their PhD now I I'm not supposed to tell that to not to put too much pressure on her, uh, but um, actually that's part of the of her background. And that's really a cool thing because um, now we have employees who can talk to our customers on an eye level. And that's also something that makes uh, us kind of unique in our in our niche and in our industry. So insurance industry usually worldwide works like you have um, your local uh, agents or brokers around the corner. And if you have any kind of insurance need, you walk up to their office and you can be quite sure if they're good salespeople, um, then you come out with the policy for the contract you wanted and to others. So um, they will for sure try to uh, to get you another insurance plan or something else they have in their shelf. And um, yeah, what, what's really unique uh, with us at the moment, we don't know any other company in the German market that uh, goes the opposite way. Focus on just one niche, one product and makes it part of the promise to the customers. We make children's health insurance and nothing else actually this and nothing else is an important part of our claim and sometimes confuses our customers when they got their children's health insurance plan with us and then come back as as a customer which they are then and ask if we would uh, get an insurance plan for their car or whatever and we just reject and say no we don't we focus on what we what we want to do what we can do where we became experts in the meantime and where we have the access and all the background experience uh, that's necessary and we focus on that and actually um, that's part of our success because Google likes that a lot if you are an expert in something and uh, have seen like everything uh, that can happen yeah I can definitely see that and I also see that for people who have had a professional career but now they have kids they might want to trade you know the corporate job with the office job to be at home to be able to to work from anywhere they want to be able to live in Portugal where it's warmer than Germany you know to be able to to live, you know, and work where their husband or wife has relocated to, maybe, or where the where the kids are going to school. And in general, it's, it's I think this is a, a big kind of feature of remote work. It's not just for young digital nomads who want to backpack the world and travel and and work in Thailand and Bali and Colombia, but families or you know or single parents that don't want to send their kids to a, a babysitter and they want to be able to work from home while still earning money. Yeah, that's basically it. I mean, um, our employees, they save so much time on commuting every day um, with uh, uh, with a train somewhere one hour to, to an office and something like that um, and still uh, earn some decent money. So yeah, this is this is a good deal for, for both of us. So, so I really like that. And um, but I guess to focus more on the people who want to travel, because that's the, the audience that are you know, is listening to this podcast is there's a lot of benefits to be able to work remotely and not live in your home country, whether it's Germany or the US or Australia. 
Yeah, and that's uh, now my exotic role in our little company. So my my co-founder is about 15 years older than me, and he's in a situation in his life where he's he's living in the area where he grew up. But now, as his uh, daughter is out of the house, she's 19 or I think 20 now, um, studying somewhere else, and he's always looking at what I do to to copy that and what I do is I have uh, um, signed off from Germany I'm not a resident anymore in Germany and also not a tax resident I left everything behind that uh, threw a shadow and did not fit into my suitcase I uh, applied for Estonian e-residency um, opened up my personal company in Estonia um, fully remote, digital, and um, that company now is the, my vehicle for, for all kind of business activities. So it's my holding structure um, and owns my shares in the German company. Um, it builds uh, the German company for my managing director's um, efforts every month, but also I use it uh, for all kind of personal business activities I do um, while I'm traveling the world. So Okay, so let's let's kind of break it down for, for everyone because I think one of the the confusions that happen to a lot of people is they're just starting you know, some people are just starting out and they're thinking, What should I what should I do? For Americans, it took me a long time to figure out, but especially with the help of Grace Taylor and her talk, uh, but also just going through it myself for so many years, now the kind of really easy, straightforward advice I give people is if you're just starting out and you're not making any money, it doesn't matter because you're not really paying taxes anyways. You know, at least for Americans. Uh, and I'm and so I'll, I'll basically I'll quickly go through what I'll, what advice I would give Americans as kind of like the easiest thing to do, the kind of medium thing, and then kind of the advanced thing to take advantage of the most. And then maybe we can break that down for Europeans as well or non-Americans. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's a good idea. And I also um, kick in with uh, why maybe an Estonian entity makes a lot of sense for American guys as well. Okay, nice. So um, basically, if you're making zero to maybe even... 50 grand a year uh, in the US, your tax burden is probably not going to be that high. Uh, maybe not 50 grand. Let's say that you're making from zero to 30 grand or something. You're, the tax burden isn't going to be that high. At most, you're paying like, let's say, you know, three to six thousand dollars a year. You can kind of just leave your your business the way it is as a sole proprietor, which is kind of the automatic. You're doing business under, under your name. You're paying a little bit of tax. It's easy. You don't really have to worry about it. The next step, if you're making a bit more and you're like, okay, I really don't want to pay this three to six grand a, a year, or you know, or uh, you're making a lot more and you don't want to um, pay, you know, ten to to twenty grand, then I recommend everyone move out of their state into a tax-free state. So from from for example, I moved out of California to Texas. Uh, you can also move to Florida or Nevada or Washington. That way, the state income tax goes to zero. And then um, the next step is if you're making, if you're out of the country. For 11 months of the year, then you can qualify for something called the foreign earned income exclusion, where you basically don't need to pay federal tax on the first hundred thousand you make, and all you'd have to pay for is Social Security and Medicaid, which is called self-employment tax. So if you're making, you know, a hundred grand or something, uh, it makes a lot of sense to move out of a tax state, take advantage of the foreign earned income exclusion, uh, and then now instead of paying thirty thousand dollars a year in tax. You're just paying, let's say, maximum fifteen, you know, uh, fifteen uh, thousand, which is still a lot, but it's it's half, um, and no California tax, so you save another ten thousand. Then, kind of level three would be if you're making a lot of money, where you just don't even want to pay that fifteen thousand, which I understand, which I didn't want to pay either. Then you can basically do everything I just mentioned, but take it a step further and open a company outside of the US. So what they call an international business company. I opened mine in Belize. So now everything gets funneled through that company. That company pays me $100,000. Uh, and now I'm, I basically don't need to pay uh, really any tax up to 100 grand. Yeah, so actually paying a salary through a foreign um, entity is the key to avoid the uh, US national uh, self-employment tax. So you only pay that if you run your business as a self-employed registered US um, citizen, but if you have a legal entity between uh, your customers and you that pays you as a natural person then a, a salary, you don't have to pay the US self-employed uh, tax on that. Uh, 
uh, but that's a thing that's not relevant for people who don't have a U.S. or Eritrean citizenship, so who are not uh, taxed based on their citizenship, but on the territory where they spend most of their time. So, I've spoken to a lot of you know non-Americans, like let's say Europeans, for example, to make it easy, and. This is kind of the same thing. I tell them, if you're not making money, it doesn't really matter because you're not paying tax anyways. But once they are making a good, like a, a bigger amount of money where they are worried about the tax, there's something that they can do. Or if they're just out of the country for six months and one day, they can start qualifying for some kind of tax break. Do, do you know what that is? Actually, it's different in every jurisdiction. And... Um I I think it's most uh, complex. No, it's not most complicated in Germany. But um, in, in Germany, the rules are basically um, it's not the the number of days that you're outside of the company, uh, the outside of the country, uh, or this or that. It's uh, let's say some indications. Uh, if they match, um, then in the end, it's quite obvious that you're not a tax resident or you are. So the first thing is uh, you officially sign off. Um, and uh, that's something that uh, is is a thing in in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, where we have a very strict regime on registering uh, people who live at the uh, place. So, if you if you live in if you move from one city to the other, um, people in the German speaking countries are used to, or they they have deep in their blood and feeling. They know the first thing they need to do is to go to the local authority and uh, register at the new place. Um, and so, uh, signing off is the is the first step. So, when you say signing off, do you mean you you go to this office and you say, "I no longer live in Germany." That's basically it, yeah. And actually, as complicated as German taxation is overall, signing off is the, uh, as far as I know, the easiest thing all over Europe. But let's say you're you're gonna live in Thailand, but you're not actually a resident of Thailand. Can you still sign off? And that's the good thing about Germany. So if you if you want to do that step as a French or Spanish citizen, um, the the French or Spanish authorities won't let you go if you can't prove that you are a resident and tax resident somewhere else. So basically, the um, the way you it works is if you are a European citizen with the right of free movement within the European Union, um, then as a Spanish or French guy or wherever you come from, you go to Germany. You sign on there uh, so you go to the German authorities and tell them I'm living here now then one week later you will get your official tax ID uh, to that address and um, with these documents you can prove to Spain France wherever that you are now a German tax resident and the week after that you go to the German uh, office and tell them I'm not here anymore and they don't ask questions so far I mean maybe this jurisdiction or this, uh, this legislation might change in the future but not in the near future Okay, and let's say you sign off of Germany. Can you still go back to visit? How, like, how long can you stay in Germany per year? Uh, as long as I want. So signing off and not having a registered address in Germany does not mean I'm giving up my citizenship or any other rights. So I'm still German. I still have my German passport. Um, and uh, the only thing I should be careful when it comes to tax residency is then the other indicators. So the first indicator is not being registered. Second one is, um, of course, not staying more than half of the year in the country, um, but also not having a uh, apartment or house um, or basically a key to um, some kind of uh, um, apartment that's only dedicated to me. Um, so you can have a rented apartment if you uh, rent it out long term to someone else. Um, so basically the, the question around it is, is the, the center of your life, your actual life in Germany or not? So if you, let's say if you're married to someone who's still living in Germany, or even if you have children in Germany going to school there, um, then authorities won't believe you that easy that uh, they're staying in Germany, but you're not. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So a lot of nomads come to Thailand just for a month, and then they realize, hey, I want to stay here for longer. Do they have to fly back to Germany to sign off, or do you know if you can do that, do that online? Um, it's different in every federal state in Germany, but what you can do for sure is uh, a letter, or uh, very famous in Germany is a fax. I don't know if you remember that thing from the 80s, mm -hmm. but uh, especially in my in my industry, insurance industry, and in all public uh, authority, public services, uh, communication, fax is a big thing still in 2019. Believe right. it or not. Well, luckily there's efax.com now. <laughs> 
Yeah, there, there are many ways to, to transfer a fax digitally um, to an authority that then prints it out on paper. Okay, perfect. So one of the worries, though, that a lot of my European friends had, they said, well, I would like to do that, but then I lose my health insurance. Is that true? That's uh, that's the other big topic we want to talk about today. Um, it's true uh, when you are so far only in the in a public system and um, that's uh, a thing where Europe is might be a bit advanced over uh, many other developing countries like the US um, we have public health insurance systems in place that really cover you from uh, from your birth uh, to your death and that really pay for severe um, severe diseases uh, cancer treatments diabetes and stuff and so um, yes if you are not uh, registered and not living anymore in in Europe then um, this automatically ends and these kind of public health insurances don't cover you in Asia so they cover you in other European countries for for most of the cases, as long as you're traveling and as long as you're paying for them. But um, uh, outside of the European Union or the European uh, single market area, you are not covered by these problems. Oh, so you wouldn't be covered anyway. So if you were planning to live in Thailand for a year, by even by having it still and even paying into it back in Europe or back in Germany, you wouldn't have gotten the benefit because if you got sick here in Thailand wouldn't have covered anyways right not here uh, for this case it, so the, the lowest um, step in, in this staircase is uh, you should have a travel insurance oh, okay you can get them cheap and uh, especially if it's travel only so covering like up to 90 days of travel uh, you often have them with your credit cards even uh, included or uh, you buy them for for less than 60 euros a year and but the main uh, the only thing that they do is uh, they cover uh, emergency costs uh, at the place and um, if you have something severe they fly you back so you don't have a full coverage here and if you have something um, that um, that needs an ongoing treatment um, then they fly you back yeah and then you're screwed because if you had signed off they fly you back but you don't have any coverage yeah. Back in Germany. Yeah, so uh, in that case, uh, you need another solution, a more sustainable solution. And then this depends on how long you plan to travel. So if you are a, a nomad, just taking your, your plan for the life is to take some five years off and then go back to your jurisdiction um, or settle down somewhere where is a, a public system in place, then it's an okay idea to sign up with some international uh, health insurance um, like Cigna for your tr safety wings and whatever they are called but if you have a long-term plan of being a nomad maybe until the rest of your life and don't want to be dependent on any state and, and government system then you need another solution okay so is it pretty easy then if you sign off and then you go back a year from now and you say okay I want to live here again I want my health insurance back um, in Germany, it's relatively easy. Um, so if your if your last uh, full um, health insurance before you left Germany was the public one, then the public one has to uh, take you back in again when you arrive. But there are some exceptions. So there are reasons why you why they offer you a plan in these cases um, that you pay an ongoing fee every month uh, to uh, to keep the right to to go back into that. Um, and that's for example. Uh, especially relevant for the care part of it so the health insurance itself they have to take you back uh, but the care does not so if you if, if something severe happens to you abroad and you come back to a care, as a care case then you might be fucked well, what's care case yeah, you get, uh, let's say, um, you get a severe um, uh, injury and you need to be taken care of on a daily basis. Like you oh, can't I wash see. yourself anymore okay. and, and things sense. like that. You need to be fed. So when you're signing off saying, okay, I'm going to Thailand for two years. I'm signing off. I'm not living in Germany now. You can opt to then say, okay, but I want to pay a monthly fee or yearly fee so I have the right to get it again when I come back. Yeah. Do you know how much that is? That's uh, uh, um, around 50 to 60 euros. Okay. Yeah, but I guess it's an expense that people don't wouldn't want to pay, but at the end of the day, it's it's worth it. And that's only Germany. And now we are talking about uh, that. I, I think that's um, 
um, a minor percentage of people who are coming from the German public system, um, living as a nomad for several years with a plan to come back. Because, I mean, in reality, um, if you talk to these nomads everywhere, especially those uh, who are traveling for, for more than a year, um, they have discovered uh, so nice places in the world. And uh, at first, they want to see more of them. And at second, uh, going back to where they originally come from um, might not be the, the highest priority anymore in the list. You know, at first I was going to disagree. I was going to say, oh, most people are just going to do it for a year or two. And then they're going to be like, all right, I'm going to go back to my normal life. But for some reason, I think Germans specifically, I, I think I agree with you that they will never go back. Is it is it only Germans? I mean, do you know anybody who had a nomad life for five, six years and then said, okay, enough for me. I'm going back to the US or very few. I know a few that have been that have moved back to the US, but even they are in the US for now, but yeah, just, just on a temporary basis. Yeah. And you know, some of them have said, okay, you know, I'm gonna stay for at least a couple years. But it's it's actually almost weird how once people kind of taste freedom and, and find other cool countries that they're like, ah, I don't really need to live back in my home country. There's yeah. other places. Yeah, I, I had this discussion over the last uh, couple of weeks, several times, and people asked me, but don't you want to go back to Germany maybe when you want to found a family or something? And I said, seriously, when when I just look back at the places I've seen so far and on my list of places that I want to see next, um, if founding a family would be, a to I mean, that I guess that's out of focus for the next two or three years minimum, and who knows what happens then. But um, if I, if that idea or that plan hits me hard, I think Germany. I, I had a great youth and childhood in Germany. Germany. I had a good education in public schools. Um, but that's the Germany I know from, from 20 and 30 years ago. And um, I know that a lot has changed there and raising children now. As, as of today, I would say uh, from the places I've seen so far, uh, Singapore is a really great place to raise children in a safe environment with good schools. Um, and that might be uh, something I would consider. So leading back to the question before, if you meet um, travelers or nomads who have had that life for several years and then want to settle down. I guess the biggest percentage of them uh, want to settle down in a place they've discovered during their travel, which is not uh, their origin and not their place where they started from. Okay, so let's say someone is German, <clears throat> they sign off, they leave for two or three years, but then they move back to, let's say, Portugal or Spain. I, I think something like that could be very common. Can they then sign on to the the Spanish or, the, or Portuguese healthcare system? It depends on the local jurisdiction. Um, but uh, for example, I know it from Cyprus, uh, where it's quite easy. So you just have to be an uh, employee um, and pay some some social insurance from your salary, which is quite easy to, to construct. So you find found a uh, limited company in, in Cyprus, then get a salary from your own company pay uh, the minimum amount and and then you're in the public system that's easy okay do you do you happen to know or to, to venture a guess if someone went to spain or do you know how they would even find that out once again like if but let's say someone didn't want to move to cyprus they wanted to move to spain or something do you have any idea how if it's possible for them to you know get free eu healthcare again or how they would find that out if they wanted to look I guess you need to consult some local uh, lawyers or experts or even, I mean, in the European Union, um, every uh, governmental uh, website and, and regulation is available in English. So it's translated to all the other uh, languages in, in uh, Europe. Because so, it's kind of a blessing and that for, as an American, we don't get healthcare anyways. So it already sucks. It sucks. I mean, I'd rather have nice free healthcare, but it's kind of a blessing because there's nothing to stop me from not living in the U.S. Because I'm like, well, the U.S. isn't giving me anything anyways. So by me just not being there, I'm not losing anything. But if I was a European and by saving, you know, by signing off and saying, okay, I don't live here now to take advantage of the tax savings by losing my free health insurance, that would freak me out. So, and I also wouldn't want to pay 50 to 60 euros or hundred euros a month for the next five years if I'm not going to use it and live there. So I would be in a really tough situation. I would wonder, is it worth signing off on? Is it worth, um, you know, exploring this, you know, should I take the risk? You, 
you're smiling, so you must have a solution. Um, yeah, but not a cheap one. And also the public solutions in Europe are basically not for free. Um, there are some countries like uh, the UK with their NHS system um, where you don't actually pay directly, but it's being paid by the taxpayers. So in the end, if you pay taxes or the, the, the general community um, society pays for it, um, but in most other countries, um, it's taken directly from your salary or you pay for it if you're not employee, uh, if you're not employed, um, then you are uh, a, a volunteer or yeah, you, you, you just opt for it and you get a price tag on it and you, you pay for it. Um, but the public systems so far have the advantage that they don't do any health checks. Um, there's, they don't check you on pre-existing conditions or something. They have to take everybody uh, by that means. Um, but what I originally wanted to refer to is um, if you have a really long-term plan, um, then you might want to make yourself independent of any government system um, because still they uh, we, we have this uh, problem of the uh, the society that changes people get older and or that the, the societies get older and older and due to that also the the costs of uh, health care uh, get higher and higher and uh, politicians with public systems have two options there one is to to raise the price and the other one is to lower the the, the service level and this is happening so in, in Germany for example uh, 20 years ago the public systems paid for for glasses or for tooth replacements that was just a normal uh, part of the the public insurance uh, but it is not anymore and so they are cutting out um, uh, those things that are not necessary anymore to keep basically to keep people alive uh, or to treat uh, severe illnesses if it's just to have uh, some nice shiny teeth um, then you have to pay for that just yeah okay that definitely makes sense uh, it's nice being in places like thailand where the healthcare is really good and it's really cheap just pay out of pocket so that's kind of the the hack and the solution for Americans who are living here at least is we kind of forget sometimes the purpose of health of healthcare or just insurance in general the whole purpose of insurance is to protect ourselves against financial hardship if something happens and the nice thing about Thailand is there is very very few things that can happen where we'll be completely screwed financially and not be able to just pay for cuz like even if you break a leg even if you get a heart attack here in, in Thailand, you can just pay for it in cash and it won't be that, that much. Yeah, but, but yeah. that's not the severe diseases I refer to. I mean, um, the those people who are watching the video version of this podcast, now they can see... The, there's uh, definitely the, no video <laughs> version, but if you were here... <laughs> uh, they can see the graph that I'm painting. Um, now, actually, um, it's... Um, it's a super logical thing, actually, uh, that uh, the health costs during your lifespan um, happen in, at, at the end of your life. So I talked to um, a senior person of a life insurance recently who told me one half of uh, all lifetime health costs um, are just caused in the last two years of your life. Wow. And uh, here we are not talking about breaking a leg and, and things like that. Uh, we're talking about cancer treatments, um, which can easily cost uh, six-figure numbers. We are talking about things like old age diabetes, where you need insulin um, yeah. on a daily basis um, or, or even other things. And you can't pay them out of your pocket in Thailand either, I guess. Yeah, I think it'll be very expensive to, to do in Thailand. I think it's it's possible. I, I haven't looked into exactly how much it will cost, but I think it's relatively affordable so even to pay for that out of pocket but it's funny that you mentioned that half of the costs are in the last two years of life because at least the way i feel now and you know things could change as i get older but in my mind now and i'm like you know what hey if i'm like 78 and i'm only gonna live two years anyways i'm not gonna spend 500 grand of my money or insurance money on trying to prolong those last two years let me just die. Like, yeah, but the, the thing is, at first, uh, you always have the, the will to live. And you never know uh, when these two years start. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that's a, one of those kind of longer uh, philosophical, you know, things that are going to come up in the, in the nomad community as this community matures. Because right now, we're still a pretty young batch of people. I mean, the people in the Nomad Summit were, you know, on average, 25 to 35 there were a few people a little bit older, a few expats, but they kind of have the expat community where they talk about things like this, you know, because a lot of retiree, all retiree expats are 55 plus, you know, a lot of them in their 60s, 70s. So they talk about these things on their, mes in their message boards, their Facebook groups. We almost never talk about these things. I give you an example. So uh, this 
I, I really appreciated your talk at the Nomad Summit where you were talking about uh, saving for your uh, retirement and, and building up that wealth that you need later on if you don't work anymore and have a real passive income. But as important is uh, the long-term health care. And uh, referring to uh, that graph again that the people in the video podcast can see now. <laughs> There's no video podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Um, as these, these cost, costs uh, appear in the end of your life, um, the thing with the current uh, Anglo-Saxonian uh, offers on the market for medical insurance is that they calculate their costs just on an every year's basis on an age group. And if you um, sign up for, for that in your 20s, you pay less than 100 euros a month. Or even if you have a, a, a low level plan, uh, you can maybe get that for 15 euros a month. Um, because the costs in that age group, they're, mm, so they're minor. So yeah, maybe someone gets hit by a, by a scooter here yeah. in Chiang Mai. And yeah, that's irrelevant. Um, the real costs happen later. And so the thing is, there, there are two, two things with these plans and why I started the conversation with, if you have the, the idea of uh, having a nomad lifestyle for five years and then settle down somewhere, this is totally, totally reasonable to have a contract like that. But uh, there are two reasons why this is uh, not a long-term solution. One is the, the cost calculation on your age group. This means if you are now in your 30s, uh, you might be uh, able to afford that easily. But if you are in your 70s, you pay um, the costs of, of the 70 years old people. And uh, that might be not affordable anymore. That's one thing. And the other thing um, is all these contracts are only on a 12 month basis. So they are recurring every 12 months if none of the both parties terminate that contract. And let's say if you get the diabetes and the insurance company knows, okay, I've paid a lot this year for, for Johnny's insulin. Um, I don't want to pay for that next year anymore then you end up screwed again. And so actually a long-term solution may only be one where the insurance company has no right to, to end uh, your health insurance contract because I mean most people who I talk to about that topic um, they're surprised and ask how come an insurance company uh, that I rely on for exactly these cases where I can't pay things out of my pocket anymore can terminate my contract when I when I pay uh, when I produce um, high costs yeah that, that, I mean that definitely makes sense I mean financially I understand from their point of view it's it's screwed up um, I guess the question would be can someone when they turn let's say 50 or 58 or whatever and they know like hey i'm gonna need this pretty soon can they sign up for the long-term contract then of course they can but it's gonna be very expensive then already but would it be more expensive than if they had kept it like because i'm assuming every year the prices go up anyways right i give you an example of my very own solution how i did that and maybe um, that yeah. inspires the one or the other i have um, so there's something very special in the in the German um, health insurance market, which is, um, and I think that's unique in, in Europe or even worldwide, um, we have a full public coverage uh, where basically everybody has to be in. And um, we have also the option, um, if you meet certain criteria, so you earn uh, more than 60,000 euros a year or you're fully self-employed, then you can opt out of the public system and go fully private. So this is not like um, British. NHS or other countries where you pay still in the public system and can buy an additional private insurance for all the stuff the public system does not cover. This is fully private. So from the uh, your your uh, painkillers uh, you get from uh, from the pharmacy to the severe um, diseases treatments, um, it's all in the private system. And as um, this is private, private companies are free to um, offer you basically whatever. The, uh, above a minimum standard, of course, offer what uh, what you want, but also uh, there's some regulation. And that means, uh, coming back to that graph, <laughs> um, they have to calculate your prices um, on a uh, based on the system of life insurance. So not like a damage insurance um, where you have age groups, but they have to calculate your estimated um, uh, rest of life uh, time and the estimated costs they will have over this uh, period. And then they have to basically uh, judge divide that by the number of months and give you your, your monthly premium you pay. Okay. And that means um, if I would start, um, I've just done a sample calculation 
calculation yesterday because we had a, a big discussion going on in the German uh, Digital Nomad um, uh, Facebook group about that. Um, if you started with 31 years and you want a pr full private health insurance that pays for everything and has unlimited worldwide coverage, you pay more than 600 euros a month. But you can be sure that this is the, um, at first, this is the price you pay for the rest of your life. Oh, so wow. This is not changing uh, by anything else uh, than uh, medical cost inflation. So there's nothing like an age group uh, okay. calculation. So it might go up by two or three percent a year. Yes. But that's it. Yeah, that's it. That's good because and 20 years from now, 600 bucks a month is going to be nothing. And the other thing is, um, at, at least if you compare it with plans uh, by by these uh, mm -hmm. Anglo-Saxonian companies where they have uh, price lists on their age group. And I've mm -hmm. just seen one today. A friend of mine sent me who's living in a German guy living in, in China. He's paying currently about 100 uh, uh, euros a month or dollars. I, I don't know what the company was. And um, he sent me the price list of age groups, which already calculate uh, age group 70 and above is 500 uh, a month. But that's from today's perspective plus mm -hmm. inflation. Yeah. And so, but this is the, the highest level you can get. I was just referring to the 600. Um, there's no deductible in that and the, the highest possible uh, price level and for who uh, and, and, and service level. And for who is interested, I can do a name dropping here. Companies called Signal Iduna with their uh, brand Deutsche Ring and uh, the plan is called Prime. That's the highest level you can get on the German market currently. But you can get it uh, lower with deductibles and I, I come back to that later. Because th the other thing I wanted to talk about is um, not only the price uh, calculated for the rest of your life, but also this insurance company has no right ever to kick you out. So once they have signed you on, they have no chance to get rid of you even if you stop paying. If you stop paying your premiums, they at least have to uh, cover you in something like an emergency plan, which means they won't pay for your your cle uh, teeth cleansing anymore, uh, but for painkillers and, uh, and some cancer treatment. So they won't let you die. Uh, even if you're not paying for them. Okay. It's funny. I, mean, I think this is a really complicated topic. We can talk all day about this. Um, I think there's pros and cons of, of all of it. And I think it's at the end of the day, it's kind of like juggling like what is in our personal best interest versus what's in the best financial interest of the, the total. Because, for example, like if I was like, let's say it was a small tribe instead of, you know, me and like 100,000 random people paying this insurance and there was one person that stopped paying and we like it's nice for him because we won't let him die but it's terrible for the rest of us so you know or if one person becomes like a super user where like they just you know they have a million dollars of bills uh, a year and it's kind of hanging on it's nice for him that he can we, we keep him alive but for the rest of the people it, it kind of screws us but so. that's that's the business model of insurance that's yeah. that's insurance actually um the the idea behind insurance is a huge collective paying uh, covering the risks of the individuals and of course you have an every collective uh, all these these minor costs you were talking about breaking a leg and something yeah. and you have um uh, hopefully a small number of uh, how did you call them? Heavy like, users. Yeah, but they did know. not choose to be heavy users. Yeah, but they could choose a stopping heavy user. <laughs> <laughs> they should just volunteer. Like, okay, I'm costing you guys too much money, guys. I'm just gonna I'm gonna tap out. <laughs> take, take me yeah. off this uh, yeah, that's, this coma. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's one one possible solution. I just wanted to, um, in the end uh, of that topic, uh, just tell you how I am doing that. Yeah, was my my personal solution, um, and that's uh, I've started early um, when when I got uh, fully uh, self employed right after school with 19 I opted in Germany for the private system I was then for two years with one company that I did not like so much and then uh, since 2003 I'm with one company called Barmenia and as I found out this was not uh, one of the reasons why I chose them but fortunately I found out that they are one of those companies who are most friendly when it comes to international coverage I started back then with uh, how old was I 21 um, with a monthly premium of 250 euros and an annual deductible of uh, 340 euros. As of today, I'm paying uh, something like a bit less than 350 euros a month, uh, but have a high deductible now of 1,440 euros uh, per year. And with that, I decided to, to stick with that um, because uh, I have unlimited worldwide coverage. Okay. And um, I have to plan for uh, living this nomad life first as long as possible. And second, um, don't want to be dependent on any state system and government 
and 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 public uh, system i still want to be um, independent and the contract partner of my my doctor myself that's great i you you had mentioned something way earlier about how the free ins- health insurance in europe is not really free because you're actually paying into it per month yeah sure do you know how much approximately that would have been where you were it's different in every country and uh depending on the standard like in germany yeah. the standard is still quite high and um it uh, even the um the membership for self-employed is depending on their income so, so like you can start with if yeah. you have a really low income of less than a thousand euros a month uh you pay about 200 euros for the health insurance 200 and if you yeah that's the cheapest that's option. still a lot actually yeah of course. and it's funny that people think it's they assume it's free but it's 200 not, for not the, it. and the actually, lowest this is, and this is the price since this year they have changed it wow. uh, until last year's was the double you had the uh, minimum uh, was 419 euros really? or something that you paid a month as uh, self-employed with low income in Germany. And, and the thing is, if you're not self-employed, it just comes out of your salary. So you don't see it, but you're basically getting paid $400 euros less a month than, than you would have been. It's 14.6% of your income if you're employed, plus an, a little additional um, uh, premium of an average uh, 0.9%. So basically you pay uh, 15% of your salary in the in the public system, which is a bit of eye washing because on your on your salary statement uh, will only occur 7.8% because there is one half that you pay as an employer and the other half as an employee. But basically for your employer, it's all the part of the employment costs. So in That's the end, funny. as an employee, you pay basically you pay everything that's something that's really funny because people don't realize that i think every european i've ever spoken to they're like oh yeah we got free health care it's so Not so amazing all. yeah people talk about that like that uh, especially in the uk where it works like that you don't have a direct uh, directly connected to payments uh, but it's coming from the taxpayers pocket so it's the it's the, the national budget that funds the nhs um, which is super inefficient and super expensive um, and most people go for minor treatments to private doctors and pay that out of their pocket but i was just talking about the the minimum uh, amount you pay in, in europe Europe with uh, little income if you have an income of more than uh, 55,000 so that's the the, the big threshold um, uh, then that's you pay the maximum amount which is this year 850 euros a month wow but it, it won't go over that so it's it's always between 200 minimum and 850 maximum that's crazy that's 850 euros a month for health insurance for but, s- yeah but I mean you, you still need to take into account uh, this is not a imaginary number someone invented this is the actual costs of uh, of healthcare, and if people think, yeah, now I'm in my in my twenties and I get that plan for fifty euros from Safety Wings or or wherever, um, then this is just a cheap offer working in your age group. But if you wanted to take into account a whole society, and that's basically on your individual perspective, the things that will come up later when you're old, those fifty uh, percent of the costs that happen in your last two years, if you sum that up and and take the average of every individual that's what healthcare really costs healthcare is overpriced i think and and i think a lot of it is no one, that no one ever talks about is why it's overpriced you know i, I know in the u.s at least and that's a completely different topic yeah. yes of course you can and 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 you, uh, germany isn't uh, even among the the most expensive countries wow. here but i i really thought that you guys had a kind of more control but that, that would definitely be uh, another an, another you know, eight podcasts to talk yeah. about. I give the you just one quick yeah. example because I have that in my head. Um, as I told you, I'm earning my money in children's health insurance. I know some costs uh, connected to children and giving birth. A uh, usual birth uh, costs in in uh, Germany, including the um, how do you call that when I cut, cut C section? Yeah, C section uh, is about three and a half thousand euros, and that's not expensive. If you go to Switzerland, you pay uh, twenty thousand easily, mm-hmm. and if you do that in a hospital in the US, uh, it will be around twenty thousand US dollars yeah. for sure. It's crazy. So the only okay. So the good thing is. Mm. Mm, and by the way, uh, pregnancy and, and costs of birth are usually not included in the basic plans for international digital nomads coverage. So girls, um, it, sometimes it happens faster than expected. Um, so take condoms with you and uh, look in your health insurance plan um, before you go out drinking. Yeah, well, I think what we can kind of learn from all this uh, is there's a lot of things we can take advantage of while we're young. 
and while we're kind of carefree. And these are things that we don't really think about when we're 25 or even 35 and we're just traveling and we say, oh, like, I don't know how long I'm going to do this for. I'm just having fun. And actually, most digital nomads of that age uh, don't even make the money to be able to to pay for that. And that's totally fine if you're, if you're young and in your 20s and then go with a cheap plan. But as soon as you uh, start earning some real money and... Uh, are in your early or mid 30s you should seriously uh, think about that yeah. topic i mean someone could i mean i guess it doesn't matter that much about age it's more like let's say once you start making over x amount 50 grand 100 grand a year a year whatever, whatever it is then it's something definitely look into but i would say i would actually say regardless if you, even if you're making 100 grand plus a year if you're 25 or 35 i would still just recommend just use, you know, annual travel insurance or like, you know, um, travel medical insurance like Safety Wing. And then when you, if if you get pregnant or if you start getting a bit older, you know, and you're like, okay, this is this is time, then move back to Europe, move back to wherever you're from, jump back on the normal plans and then you'll be set. And all that money that you would have saved, as long as you're invested in it and just blow it, hopefully that, you know, Financially, it, it seems like from the math that we're doing that by not paying the 600 bucks a month from 25 to 55, and you, if you actually invested that $600, you'd be super well off, even if you're now paying, you know, a thousand, a thousand euros a month for health insurance because you're older. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's, it's always a good idea to um, save money for the unforeseen but i mean health insurance is uh, the the reason why why it is so expensive is um the unforeseen here can be uh, something that's really out of reach by by saving for it as, as coming back to to the broken leg a broken leg is that's really minor costs from a perspective of a health insurance company the really severe stuff is uh, something that you can't afford as an individual anymore even uh, if you're well off yeah and that's where you where that uh, insurance jumps in all right well um uh, i it's, it's been an hour but i still want to talk about estonia and the e-residency it's. I think this is a uh, one of the big kind of big topics that I, I hope nobody uh, like was listening to this podcast just for that. And, and but hopefully you learned something uh, and had a lot of things to think about. Anyways, um, but uh, Christoph was one of the workshop leaders for um, at the Nomad Summit about the Sony E residency. Who is it kind of for? Like, can can you give us kind of like a brief summary of what it uh, what it is and then who it's for? This sounds pretty much like a promotion for uh, guys. Tune in for next week's podcast, and we make another show for e-residency. No, 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 no. We 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 got we got to talk about it now. Uh, okay, sure. Um, I I get no appointments today anymore, so we can uh, we can do that. Uh, e-residency is something um, that Estonia came up with uh, four years ago, and basically the idea behind it uh, can be e- summarized as government assets. So um, Estonia is uh, by far the most advanced uh, digital society I know. Um, they're in the northeast of Europe, uh, one of the Baltic countries, but also considering themselves a Nordic country. Um, and they took the chance uh, after the end of the Soviet occupation to totally rebuild their state system from scratch and made it as digital as possible as as soon as possible. So the Estonian government works paperless since 2003. Estonians are used to vote online for their uh, federal par- for the national parliament since 2005. And as of today, uh, there are only three uh, public services left that you cannot do with your digital ID card, which is basically um, things where they want to make sure that a not emotionally involved third party person makes sure that you have familiarized yourself with the advantages and disadvantages of the transaction. Um, so we're talking about marriage, um, divorce and um, selling property. For these three things, you have to walk up and see a government official. Everything else you can do online and fully digital. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, Estonia kind of came out of nowhere as a popular country. Five, ten years ago, no one heard about it. The e-residency, when, when did this come out? Uh, they have celebrated their fourth birthday um, last December. So, yeah. So I remember right when it came out, everybody was talking about it and how amazing it was. And as an American, I looked into it as well. And it looked like for Americans, there were very few tax benefits for us. Because basically everything that, that we, I talked about earlier, 
I don't need to be registered in Estonia for that. Um, but I think the one big benefit would be if I was doing a lot of business, you know, with uh, European countries or just other countries in general, and I don't want to use my Belize company, I can, you know, be an Estonian company, which seems a little bit more legit than unbleasable LLC. Um, actually, tax is a thing, but one thing um, neither I nor uh, the Estonian government wants to start a conversation with, because there are uh, some... Um, super interesting advantages of of that so coming back to what i just said how it invo evolved and how estonians became a digital society four years ago then they decided like we're 1.3 estonians and have this digital infrastructure in place that can easily handle uh, not only 1.3 million but 10 million or whatever so why not uh, give that digital access uh, to everybody who wants it and who applies for that so actually everyone can now apply for an e-residency which is nothing like a residency this is just a digital access to um, the Estonian jurisdiction so it gives you the, the the right or the possibility to sign um, legally binding contracts and uh, open up a company, run that company fully remotely. And um, that's the, the main purpose and the main uh, advantage you have uh, that you can open up a company in a super trusted reputational uh, jurisdiction within the European Union with access to the European single market. And so the basic idea behind that was to democratize um, access to international standard uh, business environment. Super interesting for people, for example, coming from Turkey, where uh, PayPal is uh, not uh, working anymore uh, because the uh, Turkish government uh, fucked with them and PayPal said, uh, okay, then no more PayPal in Turkey. But many Turkish entrepreneurs still want to use that as a payment processor. And so they can easily um, get their e-residency, open up an Estonian uh, legal entity and uh, then work from there. That definitely makes sense. So if you're from anywhere in Africa, the Middle East, or any other country that it's hard to get PayPal, that's a huge benefit of registering a company in Estonia. But of course, um, it's not only working location independently, digital access and hassle-free bureaucracy. Actually, um, Estonia is uh, has a, a corporate taxation on the table that's super competitive, especially because um, it's a deferred taxation, like you know from Belize or Georgia does it as well, but no other country in the European Union. So this means uh, basically all your profits are not taxed as long as they stay in a company. So you can use that Estonian legal entity as a vehicle for investment. Um, every money uh, that you don't take out of the company can be reinvested. You can buy um, securities. You even can you can even buy um, uh, property if you're into that and uh, build wealth within that uh, company and then only have to pay taxes one day in the future when you take if you actually take out cash, right? But then I guess you can just use your company credit card to fly business class and to Vegas to go to the you know the next conference or something. Let's say uh, the Estonian regulation is super cool when it comes to um, to travel costs and yeah. to, to business expenses. Um, so this works ongoing, of course. And also you can pay yourself a salary, which is um, as long as you are not on a personal level, a tax resident of Estonia, and the service you perform for your company is not performed within the borders of Estonia on a, a long-term basis, not subject to Estonian taxation. This so, means yeah. if you're if you're traveling the world and um, work from Chiang Mai through your Estonian company, pay yourself a salary. Um, this is not subject to Estonian taxation, but to the subject to the taxation that applies on you on a personal level. Mm -hmm. And if you're not tax resident anywhere as a perpetual traveler, not holding a U.S. passport, um, then this is basically um, not taxable anywhere. So how much can you pay yourself? For your salary wise, there is no limit in that. Uh, it just need to be somehow reasonable, um, reasonably connected to to the company's turnover. So if you uh, if you want to take out much more as a salary than the company actually makes, um, wherever you take that money from, um, then this might raise questions. Okay. So cause just as an example, let's say you know Hans is German. He wants to move to Thailand for the next five years. Step one, he you know, signs off as a German resident, a German resident, gives up his, his insurance, 
uh, let's say finds another solution for find, his yeah own. finds another solution that's a better probably a better thing uh, he starts living in Thailand most of the year he travels around you know and he registers his company in Estonia with the e-residency his company is now making 200,000 euros a year and he pays himself you know basically the whole 200,000 per, per year or I you know I, or I guess let's say he leaves a little bit in you know he pays himself a generous salary he pays himself 15,000 euros a month or something is, is that possible that uh, it's possible from an Estonian perspective but as you open up he's living he, he wants to move to Thailand for five years that makes him for sure a taxpayer in Thailand okay well let's say he's not actually living anywhere he's he's living he's a digital nomad and he's in like three months in each country in this situation, I would uh, also, um, I mean, the answer is easy. Yes, that's not taxable in Estonia. Uh, but if we go further in in uh, in this picture, I would say coming back to uh, your talk about investment at the Nomad Summit, a reasonable um, um, scheme here would be he pays himself a salary of uh, three to four thousand euros a month, of which he can easily live anywhere a good life and keeps the rest inside the company um, and. Use Use it is as a, a vehicle for investment as he is having a legal entity here in the European Union, which is then allowed to buy property, gets an, an LAE, uh, uh, what's that called, that number for legal, legal entities identifier um, to open up a, a securities account. And so this is basically, I mean, if you're a perpetual traveler, you always know the situation of opening a bank account. You need to prove your address and things like that. Um, if you have a legal entity, a company that provides all that, um, that's the perfect vehicle for, for this. Is it pretty easy to open a, a bank account in Estonia? Um, at least if you show up in person, then it's it's easy. Uh, that's the thing that doesn't work remotely because the Estonian banks uh, have their own money laundry regulations and, and more advanced uh, KYC process. So they really want to see you face to face okay. and, and want to see. Uh, I mean, I think that's very um, on, on a very subjective yeah. level. They just want to see. That's fine. I mean, yeah, like you can go to Estonia for a week. Check it out. It's definitely worth it. I've lived uh, for almost two months in Estonia last year. And um, uh, it's it's a really nice place um, for spending their summer there. Yeah, I actually was almost going to go to Estonia last year for for two months, and the reason why I decided not to is I looked at the prices and I was like, it is pretty expensive now. It's not it's not cheap cheap anymore. It's not like yeah, Poland sure. cheap or it's, Ukraine cheap anymore. Yeah, of course not. I mean, it's it's a former uh, Warsaw Pact uh, state uh, in the east, uh, but it's one of, of those who have developed a lot. Uh, They've developed then. a lot. They moved to the euro, which brings the price up yeah. for everything. Yeah, and, and the general uh, um, level of living, um, restaurants, um, it's it's European level. Um, so you can expect um, a high quality living there um, and you pay a reasonable price. But definitely it's it's worth visiting for several reasons. Um, one is, of course, nature, landscape. Um, I mean, this country is has 1.3 million inhabitants, um, but the territory is as big as uh, um, Belgium or the Netherlands, and still about 800,000 Estonians live in the Tallinn area, which makes the country pretty empty. Um, so this is a this is a great countryside. Uh, not many mountains. The highest mountain is 300 meters high, but uh, amazing forests with swamps. Uh, a great sauna culture and making business with Estonians is amazing um you come up with an idea and as this country is so small even the president of estonia is just two phone calls away so uh for example i ran uh, the half marathon in tallinn uh, last year in september and uh, mrs president uh, also ran the same marathon so she's really really touchable close to close to the people and this is not like running with uh, 20 security guys around her she was just a participant there oh that's cool and, yeah. and you've seen that uh, with my workshop here um, at the Nomad Summit. We had a, a, a live video call to the Estonian e-residency office. And right after that, we had here uh, last week the, the official e-residency week worldwide, where the, um, the government has organized several events in, in uh, seven um, Estonian embassies in the world, in, in Washington, D.C., and, and the closest from here was in, in India. Um, and so we set up as some uh, digital nomads and e-residents around here an independent community event 
And as uh, I, I've been to the e-residency office, I know these people, um, I asked them if they could somehow give us support for that. That was that was a question of half an hour. I talked to some of them on, on uh, Facebook Messenger and half an hour later, our event was listed among the official uh, events of the uh, e-residency office. That's so cool. that's how working together with Estonians works. Yeah, it, it seems like uh, it's... I applaud Estonia for taking that first step. I hope more and more countries do something similar or just make it easier to do everything online. Make it's coming. Yeah. It's coming. Georgia, for example, is so Georgia, the country in the Caucasus, is uh, implementing something similar. And also, um, I've heard that Singapore is doing something like this. Yeah, I could see Singapore doing something like that. I, I think it could be really smart, the kind of Estonia of the, the east of Asia. So I like it. Um, so I guess that's kind of that's kind of the 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 next step then right so it's so let's say someone is from the eu they you know they they give up their they sign off on, on living there they find an alternative health care they sign up uh, they they start a company in estonia become an e-resident and they start paying taxes there which are essentially essentially zero because we're not actually doing any business in estonia and depends if you if your clients are um, consumers in europe um, you have to put vat on your bills and uh, that's, for example, a tax that you pay to Estonia then. Okay. But so then, the underlying yeah. idea, but I mean, just, just imagine that, uh, is we have about 50,000 uh, e-residents as of today who have founded about 6,000 companies. But um, if Estonia will have uh, 10 million e-residents in 2025, uh, for example, and each of them pays 100 euros of tax in average a month, then the Estonians themselves don't have to pay any taxes anymore. Because by this scaling, um, there's so much money coming to the country. So let's say you're selling something to somebody in Spain and you're collecting VAT from that Spanish person. Is that all? Is, is that money going to go to Estonia then for this Estonia residence? I think in the first place, yes, sure. Yeah. Wow. That's kind of rude to Spain, right? Because now, like, let's let say me, one buys everything let me, online. Let me think. I'm, I'm not in the consumer uh, industry um, as far as uh, it's it's VAT liable because uh, insurance um, and insurance intermediaries are uh, all over Europe exempt from VAT. Uh, so I can't answer that question precisely. Okay, it's all right. But I guess it's something to look into, especially if we do e-commerce in, in Europe. But I'm sure there's a ton of other, like, you know, random things that'll come up, questions that'll come up. But I think we've gotten a really good overview of some of the benefits of the e-residency, some of the benefits of living abroad full time and kind of not living in our home country. And so, also, uh, sorry to interrupt yeah. you here, but also Estonia is coming up with some ideas for the future. Uh, health insurance is one. So you could, uh, have, as an e-residence, m maybe in future uh, pay to the social tax to Estonia and they will cover you. So they're currently in the, in the laboratory uh, of uh, political lawmaking, uh, they're discussing ideas on what they can provide to these e-residents because basically it's not um, happening in the in the current scheme of what social systems look like to to help abroad. But they're looking into that, and they have come up with a startup visa, and uh, so that's actually implemented. If you have a business idea and think Estonia might be the right environment to establish that idea, and there are many reasons for that, like a good um, VC structure and everything, um, you can apply for a startup visa, which then is not location independent, but uh, uh, gives you the right to move to Estonia and open your company there. And then you join the family of uh, Skype, which was originally invented in, in Estonia, TransferWise is an Estonian company or uh, Pipedrive. Um, and also they are currently um, discussing a digital nomads visa. And that thing is super interesting because Estonia is a member of the European Union and member of the Schengen area and if you get a, a visa by uh, Estonia that allows you to travel the European Union oh uh, wow but that is also the reason why the process is so slow because of course all the other European countries want to talk about that as well and don't want uh, membership states to give out visas like, uh, like candy like candy <laughs> um, but uh, this is coming they are after that and they just need to uh, agree with the other European countries what this should look like to meet their demands and requirements but Estonia is after a digital nomad visa to Europe I like it I, I think uh, it's exciting to see what's going to happen in the next you know two to ten years with different countries competing to have location independent 
you know, workers, entrepreneurs, digital nomads to base themselves from their country, even just for tax reasons, just because, I mean, I think even Estonia now, even without collecting taxes or anything, like how much is their fee to register there per year? Um, at first, you need to apply for the e-residency card itself. Um, that's 100 euros of state fee for a card that's valid five years. Mm -hmm. And with that, uh, then you can open up the, the company. Uh, the state fee for that is uh, 190 euros. Per, per, just one time or per month? That's one time. Okay. And uh, then if you are passionate about uh, pushing receipts into the right drawer and do your uh, accounting yourself, which you can do, it's super easy in, in Estonia compared to other countries, um, then you, you don't have any other costs. You, if you are liable to VAT, and the threshold here, also super interesting, is 40,000 euros a year. So if you are dealing with consumers and make less than 40,000 a year, you don't have to have a VAT. VAT ID and don't have to apply VAT. Um, if you're over that uh, or or apply for the VAT ID for other reasons, then you have to make a monthly VAT uh, tax statement, which you still can do on your own. It's in English, and there is even a accounting software issued by by the government by the tax authority, which some people work with. But I highly recommend you if you are really doing business uh, and don't want to waste your time on on uh, bureaucracy. Uh, uh, like accounting uh, to use a local company service provider um, there are specialized ones um, who's, uh, who uh, work with um, digital nomads, um, so solopreneurs with one shareholder, one director of the company and digital goods only, and they start from 79 euros a month flat rate for all the accounting stuff and everything. Okay, very cool. So uh, to kind of sum it up, wrap it up, I would say uh, in general, and read us in this episode if you need to because I know there's a lot of information, uh, but if you're American, there's... There's not a huge, huge benefit for you right now. Uh, of but course keep, but keep, keep an eye out. <laughs> I don't think there is because even like, as an example, like I have a, I technically am a, a getting paid by my, my Belize company and that's who owns my company. But under that company is a Wyoming company with a US bank account. So when people pay me, like when clients pay me, they're not sending money to Belize. They're sending money to my Bank of America account. That's see, based in Wyoming. Yeah, so you came to a little bit more complicated structure yeah. from first sight, and especially for for nomads who start from the beginning, they might want to don't don't want to mess with uh, several level company structures. But actually, yes, if you start making solid money, uh, then something like this makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So you know, I think as Americans, I personally don't really see any benefit for me personally to to do the residency and. In, in Estonia, but I see a ton of benefit for Europeans uh, and definitely people from countries like anywhere in Africa or Middle East where that's hard to get PayPal. And also as an American, as soon as you have uh, business partners or even consumer clients on the European market. So they, they might be in your, not in your uh, business case, Johnny, mm -hmm. but uh, many others um, who have interests in uh, the European uh, single market. And then Estonia has a good offer on the table. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I guess you look into that if you guys are just selling, you know, primarily in Europe. Um the one um, downside right now to what I've heard about uh, Estonia is uh, Stripe doesn't doesn't allow you to register in Estonia. That was kind of correct until last week. Uh -huh. uh, there was already a workaround, uh, but just uh, last week uh, Stripe announced um, that they ended their beta phase and are now uh, working on the Estonian market. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, man. you know what? Lydia's going to be very happy because she was looking to, to see where to register and that was the only thing that was stopping her. So perfect. So it sounds like it's getting better and better every day. So Yeah, they're really after that. I mean, they have a dedicated team of, I think, like 15 to 20 people now. Want to be 30 by the end of the year. And that's the that's the e-residency office in, in Tallinn. And they are super uh, communicative. Uh, they're, um, they're administrating the, the Facebook group. Uh, you can talk to them directly. And they they really uh, take up on, on the demands of the community and, and see where this goes to and where this leads to. And just in December, um, there has been a huge white paper um, published by uh, the Estonian president, the uh, e-residency 2.0 white paper, where they r definitely committed to uh, developing this whole program further after all the, the learnings from the first four, first four years. Perfect. So if you're from a country where you need to pay tax somewhere and you would rather pay it somewhere like Estonia where the tax 
rate just happens to be zero. <laughs> Take a look into it. No, it's not as easy <laughs> as that. It's not as easy as that because you always need to consider what's your personal, uh, your your um, tax residency on a personal level, yeah. and uh, what's company taxation. And if you uh, are on a permanent basis tax resident of a country like Germany with very strict CFC rules, and your um, your business entity is uh, nothing else like a virtual company letterbox in in a foreign uh, jurisdiction then uh, German uh, corporate taxation applies on that company anyway. And um, then at least from a tax perspective, you have no advantages. You still have the advantages of not being a forced member of a chamber of commerce and, and super easy bureaucracy and super easy bookkeeping. Um, but the, the tax um, is not uh, one bullet point on the list anymore if you are a general taxpayer in most of the jurisdictions in the world. Okay, but if you're not paying tax anywhere because you're not you you kind of you sign off and say I'm not I'm no longer living in Germany or in whatever country you're from, then this is kind of where you can kind of put your business funnel everything through. And there are a lot of jurisdictions in the world uh, who are not interested in your foreign income. Yeah. Okay. Panama, for example. If you're a Panama tax resident, uh, then they don't care about your Estonian company. All right. So I hope this wasn't uh, too much information for everyone. If it was, uh, go back, listen to it again. I'm sure there's a ton of things we missed. Uh, but you can also uh, find kind of some more information in the show notes. We'll have links to uh, Christoph Seitz, the Estonian uh, e-residency webpage. And if you want to ask any questions, you can either leave a comment on the the show notes page or um, just go to the Nomad Summit Facebook group. Uh, we'll, we'll share it there with the Travel Like a Boss Facebook group. Uh, I'm sure Christoph can go in there and answer some questions. If people want to find you, uh, what's the best way for me to reach you? Twitter. Twitter? Yeah. What's your, your handle? Mr. Hoopner. Uh, we will we will add that in the show notes. Okay. Mr. Hoopner on Twitter. M-R-H-U-E-B-N-E-R. That's my Twitter handle. Perfect. And if you guys want to follow me, it's at Johnny FDK on Twitter. So uh, thanks so much uh, for being on the show. Danke schön for coming. See you again. And I will see all of you guys next week, hopefully somewhere in the world. And um, that's it. We're signing off. How do you say, how do you say bye? Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. Tschüss. Thank you for listening to the Travel Like a Boss podcast. If you want to hear more, including the bonus, how to choose the perfect niche episode, join our mailing list at travellikeabosspodcast.com. See you next week. And remember, if you want to travel like a boss, you need to be your own boss. So start your online business today and start living the lifestyle you've always dreamed of.